What's cracking, ladies and gentlemen? 49 coming at you another community shoutcast for the Samsung Cyber Gamer Open League. We're loading into Risk Esports up against Arrow Catchers. I believe it's a best of one series. So these two teams I haven't actually casted before. I believe both of them are Australian. And we'll be interested to see which team is able to knock out the other. So it looks like we've got some fairly standard bans coming out from both teams. We've got a Doombringer first ban, as well as a Lycanthrope, as well as a Titan Dip ban coming out from Arrow Catchers. They do have first pick. And so because they're on the Radiant side, it forces out the Tinker ban. And so immediately we see the Brewmaster pickup coming out from Arrow Catchers. And Brewmaster is a hero that's usually called out at the first banning stage because of how powerful he is for the first 30 minutes. The biggest drawback of the Brewmaster is the fact that post 35 minutes he really starts to plateau. Because when you reach the 35 minute mark or around that area, that's when the enemy carries start to pick up BKBs. That's when they have enough DPS that could actually stand their ground and kill the Brewlings. And so you could kill Brewmaster within his split. And so it drastically hampers his effectiveness, especially once the cores start to pick up BKBs. But Brewmaster for the first 20 minutes, every single time you clap split, assuming that you're able to catch out at least two heroes with the clap, you're guaranteed to win that fight, so long as Brewmaster is able to successfully get a split off. The best way to deal with the Brewmaster is to draft a lineup that could uh, prevent him from getting off a good split. So heroes that have immediate silences, so that, for instance a silencer can activate a global silence when he blinks in. Skyrath Mage can catch him out with the Ancient Seal. Or even Doombringer, of course Doombringer is banned in this scenario. So those are heroes that work very well against the uh, Pandarian Brewmaster. Looks like Risk Esports instead opt to pick up the Faces Void and Razor combination. You usually see Faces Void and Skyrath picked up as the first two, as opposed to the Razor, but Razor also a very powerful hero that synergizes well with the Void. And so the advantage of the Faces Void is he forces the enemy team to, uh, to have to react to their drafts. And they, they are now forced to ban out heroes like the Witch Doctor, heroes like the Sky, uh, or pick up heroes like the Skyrath Mage, or the Lich, since these are heroes that synergize fantastically within the Chronosphere. But the biggest advantage of the Faces Void is you can't ban out every single hero that works well in the Chronosphere. You can only ban out uh, heroes that are exceptionally powerful, so Witch Doctor and Faces Void, as Witch Doctor can later transition into another core hero. Uh, once he gets that Aghanim Scepter, or Skyrath Mage, because it gives you that immediate pickoff power. In the face of the void, his sole objective is to start a fight five, uh, 4v5. So you go in, you Chronosphere, you kill a target inside that Chronosphere, and then you, you're good to go for the rest of the team fight. If you immediately start a fight 4v5, assuming you're able to pick off a high priority target, or kill them without expending too many resources, you start the fight at a very considerable advantage, because the enemy team are now forced to uh, react to you. If you pick off, for instance, a mech carrier, or if you could even kill a hero like a Brewmaster, who's the majority of their team fight inside the Chronosphere, uh, Arrow catches a force to uh, try to disengage. And so the advantage of the Skyrath Mage in conjunction with the Brewmaster is the Boulder Toss from the Brewmaster ensures that the Mystic Flare has enough uh, time to do its work, and Mystic Flare provides an absolutely obscene amount of damage, especially with the Ancient Seal amplification on top of that. And so the way to uh, react against the Void is you want to pick up heroes that can serve as failsafes to the, to the Chronosphere. So for instance, uh, Skyrath Mage is a good a contingency to the Void, because when Void walks in, if Skyrath Mage is quick enough, you can actually Ancient Seal him before he gets the Chronosphere off, and so you're interrupting Faces Void from getting his combo online. So that's one way to react to him. Another way is by picking up a hero like a Tree Protector or a Shadow Demon that can interfere with Void inside his Chronosphere. And so when Void Chronos, if you've got a hero like a Tree Protector, you overgrowth, Void's now disarmed. He can't do anything. You're able to wait, effectively waste his Chronosphere, and then once that wears off, because Void's usually either caught himself in a bad position or has activated Mask of Madness as well, you could turn around and kill him. He's a very squishy hero, especially in that three position role, where well, he's not going to have much farm to work with. And so it looks like we've got an Earthshaker as well as a Wraith King ban coming out from Risk Esports, and these are two support heroes that work fantastically with the Skyrath Mage. That's the biggest advantage of the Skyrath Mage, him and Shadow Shaman are currently considered the most powerful support heroes in the meta, is the fact that Skyrath Mage can set up for a tank, a durable strength heroes that have stuns. So for instance, you can use a Concussive Shot to line up a good Fissure Block, or you can use it to set up for the Wraith King. And once you hit level 2, Skyrath Mage can then provide the damage while the Wraith King provides the lockdown. And so he functions very effectively as a support hero because of that. And so now we've got a Jakira pickup coming up from Risk Esports. And Jakira synergizes well with the lineup they have so far, since when you pick up a Razor for your team, just because of the sheer pushing power you get once the Aghanim Scepter comes online, Jakira helps you take towers very early on. And because the Void and the Razor, they're very powerful heroes in these early 5 on 5 engagements. Just because the enemy uh, heroes won't have things like BKBs to react with them, or they won't have enough survivability to survive within the Chronosphere. Razor and Faces Void guarantee you to be able to win or at least break very uh, even on these fights, and Razor can help you capitalize that advantage you get by knocking down towers. And so Razor also works well with Void because you can drop the Macro Pyre while they're in Chronosphere, and Macro Pyre it does do a significant amount of damage if they sit there for the vast majority of its duration. Also works as a good counter pick to the Train Protector. But I believe Arrow Catchers actually picked up Train Protector after Jakira. And so usually you don't pick up a Train Protector if the enemy team has a Jakira 
and you can actually pick up Chikiro as a counter pick to the Tree Protector because the Liquid Fire immediately purges off all the instances of the Living Armor and Tree Protector, he is highly dependent on the effectiveness of the Living Armor. So you pick up Tree Protector, you have to have got heroes that uh, have fairly low instances of damage or a hero on your end that could capitalize on the aggressive capability. So for instance, a Weaver and a Tree Protector means you could play hyper aggressive and actually dive towers early on. But Tree Protector in this case is picked up as a counter pick to the Faces Void to be the interrupter and join the Coven Sphere. And so Arrow Catchers, they're drafting for a fairly early to mid game lineup because they know that if they're able to zone out the Faces Void in the offlane and prevent him from getting much CS, the only way he could then recover is by getting kills with the Chronosphere. And so if you're able to prevent him from finding those kills, Radiant. then the three position Faces Void really starts to uh, plateau and taper off because he needs items to be effective. While for the first, say, 15 to 20 minutes, Void can find solo kills just based off a uh, maxed out time lock and the Chronosphere. If he's not able to find those kills, and you move on past that point where he doesn't have all too many items to work with, Void tapers off incredibly quickly, especially with a Brewmaster in the field. Since Void can't actually man fight the Brewmaster, Brewmaster with the clap as well as the Drunken Brawler could actually stand his ground against Void and bring him down outside of the Chronosphere. And because it's most likely going to be a three position Void, he won't have enough damage to be the solo kill the Brewmaster without assistance coming in. And so Vengeful Spirit being picked up, not really the greatest support duo to Jakiro and the Vengeful Spirit, because Vengeful Spirit and Jakiro, you can't really consider them uh, reliable stunners, since Vengeful Spirit has such a low range on her magic missile, and since she's a, such a slow hero, unless she opts to start with boots first, in which case Jakiro is forced to pick up all the support items, you can't consider her a guaranteed stunner. Since uh, we've got 500 range on the magic missile, compare that to the Skywrath Mage that could set up from 1600 range with the Concussive Shot, now, considering the fact that Jakiro's Ice Path, you can't consider it a reliable CC. Same way you can't really consider Five Witch Doctor's Paralyzing Cast to be reliable. You usually want to draft some kind of reliable stunner or someone that could open for you. And so in this case, Vengeful, unless if Jakiro is able to land an Ice Path to give Vengeful Spirit enough time to close the distance and throw out that magic missile, Risk Esport, their support duo actually isn't as powerful as you'd like. The advantage of the Vengeful Spirit Yes, you've got the swap to be able to break out the Batrider's lasso. And interesting to note as well, Eric catches once again, picking up a hero that gets hard countered by another. So Batrider, you usually don't want to pick him up when there's a Venge on the enemy team, because Venge's sole job is to wait for Batrider to go in for the lasso, then immediately cancel it with the swap. It doesn't matter what target Batrider grabs, unless he lassoes the Vengeful Spirit, in which case, Risk Esports are more than happy to take that trade, since if Venge dies just because the Venge's aura now applies negatively, you're at least getting some kind of benefit from it by applying that Malice. And so Risk Esports, they're banning out the Morphling, and Morphling's a hero that works very well against the Faces Void, because he's one of the few carry heroes that can outlast the Chronosphere, since you can Strength Morph even when you're frozen inside that Chronosphere. And Morphling, especially if he's going to be played in that one position role, which he most likely will be, will eventually hit the point of critical mass, where he could instantly kill Faces Void with the uh, E-Blade Shotgun combo. Or he could just man fight him outside of the Chronosphere, it could outlast the Chronosphere, replicate it out, and man fight him. And since uh, Faces Void's Chronosphere is a 0.54 cast point, heroes that have an instant escape mech, like for instance the Morphling with his Replicate, are actually very elusive and difficult to pin down inside that Chronosphere. And if you could ever get Faces Void to completely whiff a Chronosphere, you start a team fight in a very favorable position. So arrow catches, looks like their lanes so far are set in stone, they haven't picked their safe lane farmer. Brewmaster can be run as a safe lane farmer in case if they want to opt for a much more aggressive mid. So for instance something like a Templar Assassin. But most ideally, Brewmaster works very well in that 1v1 role because of the rework to Drunken Brawler. Incredibly uh, con consistent form of DPS. It helps you uh, out CS the mid opponent quite handily, and because it lets you shrug off a lot of harassment, Brewmaster, despite being melee, can actually trade very effectively. And if he ever gets in range to land that clap, Brewmaster can actually even go for kill attempts or threaten the enemy mid. And so he's very powerful in that mid roll. Risk Esports, they've got about 5 seconds left. And so, so far, it looks like they haven't picked up their mid. Razor can mid, but it looks like we're going to be seeing Death Prophet in that mid lane. So Death Prophet up against Brewmaster, it should be a fairly even matchup. Since while Death Prophet usually wins mid lanes quite handily just by spamming off that Crypt Swarm, Brewmaster's durable enough that uh, if Death Prophet ever overextends, he can actually turn and trade hits quite effectively, especially if he clips over the clap. And so it's going to be a fairly even matchup on paper, since usually Death Prophet being ranged and being a hero that's with a very uh, cost efficient spammable nuke wins a lot of 1v1 matchups, but because Brewmaster is a lot tankier, then another mid hero such as, say for instance, a Puck or a Razor, it's going to be a lot more difficult for Death Prophet to bully Brewmaster out of lane since Brewmaster always has the uh, recovery mechanic of just bottle crowing. And so now we've got an Invoker ban coming up from Arrow Catchers, as Quas Exalt Invoker works very well with the Faces Void. Although, we, when you do see Quas Exalt Invoker picked up, 
in the current meta game, it's usually as a safe lane farmer, unless you're exceptionally confident in the skill of your invoker player, in which case that you could drop pretty much any hero. In a skill vacuum, assuming both players have equal skill, you usually don't see invoker in the mid lane, because with the nerfed cold snap, he no longer has the same amount of lane control that he used to have, and because invoker is such a greedy uh, mid hero, He's not really going to be ganking, at most all you'll do is throw out a sun strike. He's going to sit there and absorb as much golden experience as possible, and then maybe later on, once he's picked those Midas or his Yule Scepter, that's when you can start rotating for kills. Picking up a cross Exile Invoker in the safe lane, if they picked up Invoker instead of the Death Prophet, means that they can have Razor as their a mid lane farmer faces Void in the off lane, and every single time Void goes in with a Chrono Sphere, you drop a Sun Strike, and that guarantees you a kill. And so it's a lot of great synergy coming out from those two heroes. It'll, you also have the setup coming in from Jakiro and Vengeful Spirit. If the Avenge ever is able to initiate with the Magic Missile, you have so much lockdown coming out from the Jakiro to follow up that you should be able to guarantee a kill. And so while I'm talking about the Vengeful Spirit uh, Jakiro support duo as a fairly soft duo because they don't have any reliable way to initiate, unless the enemy misplays. If they do get that first magic missile off, it's going to be very difficult for arrow catchers to be able to survive that onslaught, although they do have the uh, living armor to rely upon, at least until Jakiro picks up level 2 liquid fire, at which at that point the liquid fire will burn through instances of the living armor and effectively render the Trine Protector to be fairly ineffective. The advantage of the Trine Protector and the Skyrath Mage is while it's a soft support duo in the sense that they have no hard TC, they actually do a fair amount of damage. If you catch out a hero, if they for instance go in their supports and they catch out say the Jakiro, Concussive Shot into the Leech Seed and then Trine Protector starts punching them. And so you do have a lot of damage potential coming out from them. But very surprised that they opted to pick up these two since Faceless Void, the only reason why he works as an offlane hero is against soft support duos. So they, we're talking about support duos that don't have enough lockdown to be able to uh, lock and pin them in place for your carry to be able to deal damage to finish them off. Or support heroes that could actually uh, neuter the advantage of the time walk. So for instance, Disruptor works as a great counter pick to the face of Void. And so long as you place an aggressive ward, so say if, in this case if you place a ward say here, so when Void time walks forward, you simply glimpse him back in once you have level 2 glimpse, you've got more range than the time walk, and then you kill Void, because Void without time walk is effectively dead, especially if you've got 3 heroes BD on them. And so we're going to introduce the players from both teams. Over on arrow catchers, we've got Joker. Over on what looks like the 4 position Skyrath Mage. Saz going to be the 1 position Gyrocopter. Nevdi going to be the 2 position uh, Brewmaster. Captain Kirk going to be the off lane uh, Batrider. And Big Tropical Man going to be the 5 position over on the Trine Protector. Looks like one of the players from Risk actually is in the bathroom. So they should be resuming us fairly shortly. And over for Risk Esports, Bloodlock, their captain. Going to be over on the 5 position uh, Jakiro. Elusively going to be over in the 4 position Venge. Nick going to be their 2 position as the Death Prophet in the mid lane. Cubit going to be their safe lane farmer over on the Razor. And Gimli going to be their face of Void. Probably going to be rotating to the off lane. And so another advantage of Risk's esports support duo is while it's fairly unconventional in the sense that you don't have a setup, you do have two very durable support heroes, both Jakiro and Vengeful Spirit. Probably the tankier support, tankier support heroes that you have available, since Jakiro has excellent strength growth and excellent starting strength, and Venge, her strength growth has been buffed significantly. And looks like for now they're actually rotating to the bottom lane, so we could actually be seeing an Ag try coming up from uh, esports, uh, Risk Esports. And so that leaves uh, the Razor left as the safe lane solo up against the Batrider. And in that case, Razor does okay against Batrider, but at the same time, Batrider or it can actually out DPS the Razor, especially if he gets more than four stacks and can threaten the kill. And so Razor has to be playing fairly carefully. The best way to lane against the Batrider, especially if you're solo, is to ha play so aggressively that he's that the Batrider is at such low HP that he can't commit to go for a kill. Since Batrider has to be near, at least have relatively full HP seconds. if he wants to commit for a kill, especially if he wants to dive behind your tower. And so Razor can actually try to win the lane decisively if he gets a good link off and is able to throw a few cheeky right clicks. And you see that Razor's already started with Magic Stick at 1, so really a good awareness coming up from him since he knows that he's going to be left alone against the uh, Bat Red. And since Bat Red has to spam out the Napalm in order to find CS, you're guaranteed to get all these charges. So Razor, once he gets 2-3 points up in that Plasma Field, he can constantly spam it out to keep the uh, Bat Red at bay. And so it looks like we've got the safe lane, tri lane coming up from uh, uh, Arrow Catches. But the drawback to this is the Trade Protector and the Skyrath Mage, because they don't actually have a massive amount of damage potential until level 2. Since Dream Protector, he might actually be forced to steal Living Armor at 1. As well as a Joker actually might be forced to go for Concussive Shot at 1 as well. Because Risk Esports have such a durable support duo, they can look to go for kills, but at the same time, once level 2, level 3 comes online for these supports, it actually becomes a fairly even matchup. Risk, they do have the better initiation just because they've got hard TC. Whereas arrow catches, at most all they have to work with a SNES. It's going to be difficult for 
at both lanes to be able to find some farm, especially since you carry the advantage of Jakiro in that try v try roll or in a 3v1 roll. It's the fact that you're always going to have to keep in mind the look of fire ass. So it's constantly going to be applied that dot. He actually gets in all, all three. And he just keeps nibbling away at you. The poke damage that comes out from Jakiro's liquid fire, it's definitely something that you can't really underestimate. Because it effectively forces you to have to buy another set of consumables to be able to stay in lane. Otherwise, they're going to be able to passively zone you out. And since Gareth Mage is such a squishy hero, you've got to be very careful. While when he's playing aggressively, he works fantastically. Because you could usually out DPS them, but if you're the one getting initiated upon, if he gets called out by, say, an Ice Path or a Magic Missile, he's going to die incredibly quickly. Especially with the time locks coming in from Faces Void. And interesting to note as well, Gimli, Optus is out with Quantum Blade at 1. That's just to ensure he doesn't miss any CS. Faces Void, he's probably the least likely candidate to go for a Quantum Blade. Just because he hits like an absolute monster truck at level 1. But that being said, if you're playing this Ag Try and you want to uh, out CS the enemy carry and place a lot of pressure on that, it does make a lot of sense. But Saz, so far leading the CS scoreboards are 6 for 0. And Gimli is only 3 for 1, so he's actually not doing 2 crash shot. And over in the mid lane, this should be a fairly even matchup. Neither of the mids should really be able to threaten the other or go for a kill. Nefty going to be running forward, going to throw out a clap, as well as a cheeky right click. No brawler crit. And so this is what I'm talking about in the sense that while Brewmaster is going to get bullied by the Death Prophet, he could give as good as he gets. Just because he's tanky enough that he could ignore the Crypt Swarm, run up to her, throw out a clap, and then get a few cheeky right clicks, especially if he gets a brawler crit in exchange. He's actually bullying out Nick. And in terms of CS, looks like they're both fairly even. Death Prophet, while well, she provides a massive amount of offensive capability, if she's on the back foot, she can't really man fight against Nefty, and he knows this. So he's more than happy to be able to eat the Crypt Swarm if, he, if it guarantees him being able to get a clap off. And so the Death Prophet has Nick has to back away a lot earlier. Since if he doesn't get caught out by the clap, if he's ever able to um, get Nefty to be able to whiff the clap on him, and you turn around and can stand his ground, get a few more right clicks, and then throw out a secondary Crypt Swarm. And so that's how Death Prophet goes for kills. You throw out right clicks and you finish him off with the Swarm. Because it's got a 900 range, so it's something that a lot of players underestimate. And the advantage of the Death Prophet is you usually have room control, especially up against the Brewmaster. But Nick, he's still eating those claps. And over in the bottom lane, looks like Joker could be the one taking a fall. And looks like he, Gimli is able to get first blood over in him. So it looks like Time Walk was there to be able to set up the Magic Missile. And so that's the advantage of having Void in that aggressive, uh, say, in that aggressive uh, farmer role. It's the sense that Time Walk, it does have a fairly significant snare, and so you can use it to set up. Looks like he actually opted for an early point in Backtrack, would have actually preferred a point over in Time Walk. Backtrack over on Void, it's probably his most uh, overrated ability. You actually don't really need a single point in it. If you really want to, you could go for two points in Time Walk and then max out the Time Lock. You need to get it. Two points is the optimal number for time walk to give yourself enough initiation range so you can comfortably initiate from outside of vision range at night time. But you want to max out time locks. That's what gives Void his killing power. It's the reason why he's picked up and runs an offlane here. It's because it gives double damage inside Chronosphere. If you don't have time lock maxed out, you can't ever go for solo kills unless if you're significantly farmed, in which case you could kill the with or without the time lock. And so time lock is the reason why Void is so powerful. It's the fact that not only does it do a significant amount of magic damage at all stages, it's the fact that it does double damage inside the Chronosphere, so when that comes online, if you've got a maxed out time lock, it's potentially 140 magic damage every time it procs. And since it's pseudo-random, you're guaranteed to get at least 3 inside your Chronosphere, and that's going to be enough damage for you to bring down a hero at full HP, especially if you've got a bit of follow-up coming in from your supports. So Bloodlock, going to continue to poke Saz with the Liquid Fire, and the advantage of having an Ag Tri lane as a hero is when you push the enemy heroes back towards the tower, you start spamming that Liquid Fire on the tower. And so you're getting a, a lot of free harassment damage on that tower as well, elusively. And so he's going to be maxing out the uh, Magic Missile, so fairly standard build coming up from him. And Saz looks like he's actually chosen to forego the Homing Missile for now, going to be maxing out the Rocket Barrage as well as the Flat Cannon. It's a very standard build. He's actually a bit too far forward right now. They could choose to go for a kill attempt. Ice Path actually latches. Concussive Shot's immediately there as well as the Ancient Seal. But considering the fact that Bloodlock, he's only got one actual ability that he could use, which is going to be that Ice Path. Ancient Seal, perhaps a bit hasty, it's a good waste of mana over on the Skywrath Mage. And so the best way to deal with the Skywrath Mage is to just carry more uh, regen. So if he could outlast his mana pool, especially if he's constantly spamming out the Arcane Bolt, once Skywrath Mage drops to about 100-200 money, he doesn't have enough to be able to get his full combo off, that's when you start to play a lot more aggressively. So a lot of teams, they actually choose to counteract the Skywrath Mage by starting with an extra set, of uh, tangos to ensure that they could outlast since HP regen is a lot cheaper than mana regen and once Skyrath Mage starts to run low on mana especially if he's constantly throwing out the orb to harass you that's when you play aggressive because when Skyrath Sky Mage without mana he's effectively a range creep so he really can't do anything to contest you and because he has such low armor he's very vulnerable if he gets turned on and so Bloodlock 
when you're maxing out that liquid fire. And you see the power of that liquid fire, it completely negates the effectiveness of the living armor coming out from the train protector. And also, uh, so it means that the train protector pickup, he's there solely to try to counteract the void with the overgrowth. Because you can't rely on the liquid fire, on the uh, living armor, sorry, especially with the liquid fire, and because time lock counts as a separate instance of damage. And the train protector in the late stage of the game, He's still going to be a threat just because of Overgrowth, but because of Jakiro, if Jakiro wasn't there, the Tree and Protector pickup would be a lot more successful and would give them a lot more killing power since it let them play a lot more aggressively. But because the Jakiro is there and new to the uh, defensive capability of the Living Armor, he can't play as aggressively as he'd like to. And so now we're going to go over to the off lane, which is actually a fairly important lane in terms of uh, since they've got the Batrider, and Batrider can be a massive playmaker. Captain Cook actually out CSing uh, Kubit. So very interesting that Kubit has is being zoned out so heavily, especially with the fact that he's got magic stick uh, charges, so he can constantly spam out that plasma field. And so the thing that you have to keep in mind when you're playing against the Batrider is four napalm stacks is the magic number. If you get above four, if you have four napalm stacks on you or more than four, the Batrider can choose to dive you and kill you because he's going to out DPS your tower, he's going to out DPS you, and then if supports actually rotate in, he will still be the final kill. If he is, if he's got four stacks of napalm or more, so that's why you want to either try to play passively when you've got three or four stacks up on you to ensure that he can't play aggressively or you want to uh, give as good as you get and keep him low by spamming out your plasma field to make sure that he can never threaten you and in this case looks like he's actually got three stacks up on him will be coming off cooldown fairly shortly so Cubit he has to back off now especially since he's just used his plasma field and Captain Kirk interesting to note he's actually opted to max out Napalm over Firefly and so this is a very old school build over in the Batrider you used to max out Sticky Napalm before you'd max out uh, the Firefly, back when Napalm used to deal full damage to uh, hero, non-hero units and used to actually cost less mana, so it used to cost 15. Now, in order to increase your mana efficiency, you actually max out Firefly because it's a lot more efficient than having to spam out the Napalm. The 5 extra mana cost doesn't seem like much, but when you're constantly uh, throwing it out to be able to uh, farm creeps in order to be able to threaten the enemy hero and to be able to jungle CS, it does, mean, it does make a fair amount of difference. And so having more points in the Firefly gives you a lot more uh, utility, and it also means that if you're playing aggressively, you don't need as many Napalm stacks to be useful. Since Batrider, if he comes into a team fight, or if he comes into a, a gank with multiple heroes, he's only going to get one, maybe two stacks of Napalm off before the things go down. He's not going to be able to start a fight with four or five stacks and have that bonus damage to work with, just because he doesn't have the luxury of time. And so it's why you usually see Batrider players max out Firefly. You do see Batrider players actually, some of them actually opt for a point over in Flame Break past level 6, but you usually see Flame Break not level for too long, just because, <laughs> it looks like we've got a few words happening from both teams, just because you don't actually have the mana pool to sustain it, and so players like Funic, they actually opt for 2 points in Sticky Napalm, and then they'll opt for a point over in the uh, Flame Break, once they've maxed out their Firefly, so at around level 8, level 9, that's when they opt for it, and that's mostly just to uh, break channel abilities. That's the, a Flame Break, it is a very powerful ability, but because it chews through so much mana, if you have no form of reliable uh, mana sustain, so for instance having something like a bottle or a magic stick, uh, you really can't afford to expand your mana like that, since, especially with the increase in mana cost to the Flaming Lasso, it now uses up about half your mana pool, so 225. So it looks like we do have some words happening actually, I guess I will just quickly put over a background screen, I guess they want me to put over a background screen, I'm more than happy to continue going on. Looks like Gyrocopter has reconnected, so says things are good to go. And so hopefully we should be reconnecting. Just gonna take a quick look at Golden Experience while we're still paused. About 300 experience lead going in favor of Arrow Catcher, so nothing too significant, just due to the fact that they've got a lot more last hits and more denies over on their three cores. And in terms of Golden, actually it looks like Risk are leading at 150. So that's fairly, uh, that's just due to the fact that they got First Blood. And so if you look at uh, all three cores over for Arrow Catchers, Nevdi, Saz, as well as Captain Kirk, they actually are out CSing uh, Rick's counterparts. To Death Prophet, actually opted for an early point over in the uh, Exorcism. In some cases, you actually see uh, Death Prophets completely forego ult until 9 and go for a third point in Witchcraft, and that's when you want to spend more time controlling the lane. So Nevdi, playing very far forward, he's got split, he's actually looking to go for a kill attack, and he should be able to find this. Nick, Boulder Toss actually came out very late, it's a bit slow with the fingers there, but Nick should be taking a fall, especially with the split being committed. He's trying to juke it out for as long as possible, the immolate damage should be enough, and it looks like the second boulder toss is there. And so this is the issue with the Brewmaster, when he hits 6, or when he's about to hit 6, you have to play a lot more passively. Because he's more than happy to expend that split for a free kill, and if TP support doesn't come in, even if TP support does come in, if the Brewmaster's quick with the immediate uh, boulder toss coming out, he should be able to bring you down. And so Nevdi, able to really punish 
uh, the Death Prophet from being a little bit complacent there. And so Cubit. Actually, I thought Kirk would play a lot more aggressively against him. Looks like he's just picked up a Ring of Regent to provide some sustain. Probably going to go in towards Tranquil Boots. And then once those Tranquil Boots are up, looks like he's got them flying out towards him. He's going to be going towards the uh, uh, Blink Dagger as soon as possible. And so this is the thing that you have to keep in mind with the Bat Reddits. The reason why he has fallen out of the competitive scene. He is being picked up uh, fairly often by teams like Na'Vi that have very experienced Bat Reddit players. But overall, Bat Reddit used to be consistently picked or banned in every single game. Now he's tapered off because Sticky Napalm it now only applies half damage, bonus damage to non-hero units. And so it disables or at least hinders his ability to recover. And the reason why Batrider is so powerful is if for whatever reason you're able to zone him out in lane, he could always go and stack out a jungle camp to clear him out. And so you can rotate to the jungle very effectively. Now because it adds half damage, you still can do that, but it's going to be a lot slower. And Batrider is all about the timing. You want to ideally get a 10-11 minute blink dagger, or at the latest 14 minutes. If you don't get it by that point, the enemy supports have enough levels that you might actually not be able to kill them if you're going on them on your own. And your team is relying on you to be a the initiation. Tropical Man, looks like he gets called out with a magic missile, but Saz stands his ground with the living armor. Gimli, homing missiles flying out towards him. He's standing his ground, but he's got to be very careful. He expended that time warp. Looks like the Rocket Barrage is there. It's going to force Gimli back. But Bloodlock, he's at full HP, and Saz takes a fully overextended. Elusively has a second magic missile. Big Tropical Man, no Nature's Guys available. He pops the living armor, but he takes a fall. It looks like Elusively, he actually gets two kills there. And so looking very good. And Gimli, despite playing very far forward, Saz kind of overcommitted there. If he'd started to back off a lot earlier, would have been safe. Nyx also rotated over to the bottom lane, got that maxed out crypt form, so that gives him a huge amount of killing power. But that's being pinged out. Looks like he is actually overextending himself, especially the creep wave. He actually pops Exorcism. Homing missile's gonna fly out, and supports rotating, but it could be a little while. Concussive shot flies to set up the homing missile. Rocket Barrage unfortunately has one off, and Nick he actually sent his ground now. Joker's called out the magic missile. Big Tropical Man doing what he can, but Joker's gonna get smacked down by Gimli. And Saz, the Rocket Barrage has been eaten up by two heroes now. Nick throws out a few more right clicks, and with the phase boot moving to be, should be to bring him down. And so we've got a Nefty now rotating. Primal Split is available, as well as a Blink Dagger. So that's an 8 minute Blink Dagger up on the Room Master. So for the next 12 minutes, they've got team fights being guaranteed. He can actually blink in, clap on Nick, and then split. Although the Exorcism just barely heals him back up. And so Nefty's looking to set up, gets a clap over in three. Actually holding on to split, he's actually out of mana for it. And so Nefty, bit of a misplay coming up from him. If he had a bit more mana, because he opted for a point over in Haze, you usually see an early point in stats on the Brewmaster if you're going to rush a Blink Dagger to ensure that you don't run into that exact same scenario. So you could clap, then immediately split. If he'd done that, he would have found two kills there, especially with supports rotating in. Kirk, looks like he baited out the Link. Link has been wasted, so now he can play very aggressively against Razor. But Cubit opting to go for Phase Boots this game as opposed to Treads. Treads or Phase, both are equally viable over the Razor. It really does boil down to player preference. In this case, because you're against a Batrider, Phase Boots th does make a lot more sense. So, you, so the, the longer you're able to stay outside of Firefly range, the higher your chances of survival. Especially since Kirk doesn't really have his, uh, be, uh, his Blink Dagger yet, but he's two thirds of the way there. And level 9 is actually out leveling Razor, so he's doing very well for himself. 42 for 4, he's leading the CS scoreboards. Cubit, not doing too bad, but considering the fact that Razor should have actually had a lot more easier time, a lot more of an easier time this lane. Lucily now comes in, Zach Link's being used as well to be there, zone him out, especially if he tries to go through trees. It provides uh, flying vision. Nefty comes in over and elusively. Elusively takes a fall. It's a brawler crits there. Nefty now called out a nice path. No mana to be the split. He's going to bottle and then blink back in to try to re-engage. Living armor going to be purchased off by the liquid fire. And Nefty could actually choose to die this with Cubit immediately selling. So leaving nothing to chance. And over in the mid lane. Looks like Nick is chasing big tropical man. No points up in the nature's guys. He actually could be taking a fall. Nick, one more right click and the crypt will be enough. A big tropical man immediately pops self. So he's going to force out. And Nick to be able to expend another Crypt Swarm if he wants to go for the kill. Don't think he'll be able to find that kill attempt now. So Nick just rotates back mid. And Sav being left alone against Gimli. And because uh, Rocket Barrage works best against hero against heroes in melee range. And since Faceless Void is a melee hero. Gyrocopter works uh, absolute wonders against him. So they can afford to leave Sav alone against Gimli. At least until level 6 comes online. Once the Chronosphere comes online, Gimli might be in a turn. Elusively, leading the charge, but Saz immediately backs himself off. Phase boots up on him, so fairly standard build over, over, over in the Gyrocopter. Similar to a Luna, you want to go for a BKB as soon as possible over in the Gyrocopter. Because once you have that BKB, because you do so much damage with your abilities, you're ready to fight. And so that gives you the an early teamfight advantage, especially when you've got the Brewmaster as well. Looks like Split was committed over a Nick, but I don't think they'll actually have enough damage to be running down this time. They used the Cyclone to try to go in for a Starcraft 2 block, but Nick, he's got Phase Boots, so the block wouldn't have worked anyway. So second Bullet Toss flies out, and Brewmaster's forced to back off. So the Split's been completely wasted. And that's a huge amount of team fighting Pettis going in their hands. It looks like over in the bottom lane, they do trade core for core, but Joker, he could be taking falls elusively. Magic Missile coming off cooldown. Magic Missile's there, and then the Wave of Terror brings him down. 
for Scarlet Mage, bring down her lost lover. Things are getting a bit tricky for him. Hubert has to be careful now as Kirk's now TP back up top. He actually has enough mana for the Blink Dagger, and so about 11 minute Blink Dagger over the Batrider. Fairly standard timing for him. He now has to look to uh, make plays and set up space for the rest of his team. Especially since uh, Brewmaster wasted the split, they have to go for a solo pick off now. Because if they rest on their laurels, because uh, Arrowcatcher's lineup doesn't scale as well as Risk Esports lineup, they can't afford to uh, let the game go late. They have to try to take as many objectives as possible when they have that 35 minute window that the Brewmaster gives you. If you're not able to breach high ground, or at the very least take a bunch of tier 1s and tier 2s, it becomes very difficult for you to recover. And it looks like Gimli expanding that Chronosphere with a little bit of help from his supports is able to bring him down. And Bloodlock actually opting to go for a point over in Dual Breath. You usually see Jakiro players completely forego Dual Breath and opt to max out that Ice Path because it provides you such a massive increase in lockdown, especially in long drawn out engagements. But at the same time, Dual Breath it does provide you an extra instance of damage, and so it's another great way to be able to break through the Living Armor, since you've got the two ticks of damage and then the dot damage on top of that. So Jakiro immediately is able to break all instances of Living Armor. Joker has to be very careful. Elusively throws out the Howl, wanted to go get in range for the swap, but not going to be there. Gimli could have chosen to try to initiate that with the walk to buy his supports enough time to be able to follow up with the Ice Path. Chose not to do so. Looks like he's going for the uh, Mask of Madness, a very standard build order for the Faces Void. Looks like Ward is being pinged out by Bloodlock. He drops his own ward. There's no Sentry available. I believe they do know that a ward is there and elusively. He's got a Sentry wards there. Might look to de ward it, but it looks like they're just. They're not actually aware of it so far. So Bloodlock, gonna do what Jakira does best. Walk up, throw in a cheeky liquid fire, then back himself off. So the fact that you could constantly deal uh, free harassment damage, similar to, say, for instance, a sniper with a shrapnel or a pugna with a nether blast, it's very difficult to lane against these heroes just because they're able to continuously apply this de uh, pressure to your towers. And if you ever rotate out of lane, they actually might be able to take the tower on their own. And so it constantly forces you to have to deal with them. Looks like over in the mid lane, Nefty really wants to go into for a kill with that double damage, almost gets it, but Nick is able to uh, just barely keep himself alive. And Kirk revealing this blink dagger. Looks like Death Prophet's going towards the Yule Scepter Rush. We'll be having it very shortly. And Death Prophet actually opted for a very early point over in the Grave Silence to use ag predominantly against the Room Master. So if he goes for a clap into Split, you can silence him after he claps so he can't split. And that actually might have been the reason why I was able to keep himself alive. Elusively, caught up with the Concussive Shot, and with the Magic Missile, stands the ground against Saz, but the cooldown lands over into a Bloodlock. He's going to eat both ticks of it. Arcane Bolt flies, and with that Rocket Barrage, he should be the Sacrificial Lamb. Elusively, as well, has to be careful as Captain Kirk. He's got flame break, but Gimli comes in, throws at the Chronosphere, unfortunately traps himself in the tree line, and Gimli he cuts his way through the Quelling Blade, but the vast majority of it is wasted. And Nefty, he's caught up the silence, but he should be able to bring down Lucifer, he just brawls him down. He's got the clap available, so like a European colonizer, he's gonna give the indigenous people the clap. Splits, tries to go on over, and Nick actually used the uh, debuff perch to try to do actually to try to deal with our Nick. But unfortunately it looks like they weren't really able to deal with him. Cubit's now rotated in. The Earth Panda, they're going to be on the chasing, since that's the one that the uh, Pandaren Brewmaster returns to, takes priority. And Nefty, because the Eye of the Storm cancelled as Blink Dagger, he should take a fall. Gimli just smacks him down. So Nick with the Exorcism, able to create space. Well, Gimli, despite landing a bit of a horrendous Chronosphere, but trapping himself in the tree line, still able to recover very nicely. And Risk Esports looking very strong. They did have to rotate Cubit uh, to accomplish that, but they're more than happy to do so. And once again, it really does boil down to the fact that Train Protector, because he's so uh, heavily countered, by both the Death Prophet and by the Jakiro, since the Exorcism Ghost also count as separate instances of damage. The Living Armor isn't as effective as you'd like it to be. And since tra living, uh, Train Protect is picked up 9 times out of 10 because of the Living Armor, it really uh, hampers the support duo coming out from Arrow Catchers. If they'd picked up a much more aggressive support duo, they could have maybe attempted to class Try Be Try it. Uh, better, they could have, in, in this case, since the Shadow Shaman was banned out, they could have gone for something like a Venomancer or even a Sand King would have been a better pickup because the living armor is completely useless. Uh, Train Protector can play very aggressively if it's 3v1 with the Elite Seed, especially with the Concussive Shot to set it up. But with Risk, both their supports having such a high amount of CC and such a high amount of base HP in compar comparison to yours, they, he, they can't really do that. If they run in like that, they can stand their ground and turn, especially with the Ice Path and the uh, Magic Missile. They've got enough lockdown. They can probably just immediately turn around, control the Train Protector, go on the Skyrath Mage, ignore the Train Protector, then turn around and go to finish him off. So Nefty, despite a great mid-performance coming up from him, because the early tower advantage is starting to fall in favor of uh, Risk Esports, one tower in their hands, as well as the five kill lead, it's going to be difficult for them to try to recover. Because Arrowcatcher's lineup is dependent on being able to win the uh, mid-game, especially with the way that they've drafted with the Brewmaster pickup. You can't pick up, you don't pick up a Brewmaster and expect the game to go late. If you pick up a Brewmaster and you let the game go late, you've already put yourself in a significant disadvantage just because Brewmaster does taper off very quickly. 
past the 35 minute mark. And so you want to achieve as much as possible while you still can. And then, or, so you either pick up uh, more early game heroes to synergize with the Brewmaster to guarantee you being able to win these fights and take these early towers. Or you pick up very powerful late game heroes so that the Brewmaster can create space for you and then you can try to take the late game. In this case, the Gyrocopter isn't going to be that late game hero just because he opted for Greed and because the face's void will outcarry him. Looks like Captain Kirk going over Gimli, but Gimli stands his ground as man fighting Kirk. Coin is being used. He's standing there eating up the Firefly, and Kirk should actually be taking fall. So you have to respect the power of the face's void. It's, it's all once again boils down to that time lock dealing double damage inside the Chronosphere. Now that he has the Mask of Madness, Captain Kirk, a lot of, ever since he's picked up his blink tanking, he actually hasn't gotten a single successful kill. And so the Batrider pickup is also starting to taper off in effectiveness. And because Batrider has to be able to uh, create the space early on by going for these pickoffs, and because once again the support heroes counter him quite handily, with the Ventral Spirit being there to uh, instantly cancel the lasso, very surprised that Arrow catches. Uh, opted to go for these pickups with both the Train Protector and the Batrider immediately after Risk Esports had picked up the Vantage and the Jakiro. And so Draft is favoring uh, Risk Esports. And because we're already halfway into the time of our Brewmaster's window of effectiveness, things are looking grim. Especially since it looks like Faces Void's going for the loader build, so he's going to be picking up a, Mol a Maelstrom and then maybe turning that into a Molnir. Nefty goes in over elusively, but elusively immediately throws out the stun. He's got the swap available if he wants to maybe throw one of his teammates in, but he's going to be standing his ground. Keep it. Uses the mech. Cooldown also being committed. They're going in over on Bloodlock. The Captain Kirk, he's got Lasso available. <laughs> it looks like a very messy fight happening. Cubit being driven back. Firefly might actually be able to clean him up. Eye of the Storm is being forced. And it looks like Bat Rider is able to clean up Bloodlock. Should actually be able to finish off Cubit as well. Flame Rank, not going to be enough damage, so it's going to force him to blink in. But he actually backs off. His immediate TP is coming out. But Nick, standing his guard up against Nefty. As it looks like they waited out the primal split. Nefty is going to be forced back. Gimli gets another cheeky right click over on Big Tropical Forest. And he's got Time Walk available if he wants to commit to go for a kill over on Sad. Using that Mask of Madness to provide that movement speed. He's going to try Time Walk forward blind. There we go. He catches out Saz. If he gets one lucky Time Walk, it'll be enough for his death. There we go. Flies. We've got the Centaur being micro, but it's not going to be enough. Nick cleans him up. Captain Kirk. Actually going to be cycling up in the Yule Scepter. And Gimli, he could actually be the Sacrificial Lamb, but elusively immediately comes with the Nether Swap. And Gimli advises him enough time to walk forward. To Kirk. He's now a bit out of position. Firefly is going to be wearing off fairly soon. Defensive Fire Ice Blast drops. Nefty does clean him up with the clap. But the static link's being used in Nefty and Joker as well. I have to be very careful. This is the weakness in Sky Wrath Mage because he has such low armor. The Razor completely destroys him. And Cubic gets a cheeky double kill off the back of that. Looks like he's going for a BKB very early on. And Big Tropical Man still no points over the Nature's guys. And so he backs himself off. Unfortunately, it looks like they didn't spot that. Otherwise, they could have chosen to commit. And the Razor pick up doing absolute wonders. Well, he'd actually lost his lane to the Batrider. Because uh, his team have been, pick have been picking up slack by winning the mid lane and by winning the off lane, it's looking a lot more difficult for arrow catches. Actually, even the mid lane was fairly even. I'd say actually Nefty probably did win that mid lane. But because the as tri lane fell apart so decisively, because their support duo isn't really accomplishing anything, they because they're being threatened by the aggressive tri lane, they couldn't rotate mid. And so it meant that Nefty was left on his own. And while he did find kills over the Death Prophet, because they uh, lost kills in return, up against Risk Esports and gave a lot of early golden experience to their supports, made it a lot more difficult in these early engagements to try to win because you've got a lot of HP now up on Jakira, 910, and about 900 up on the Ventral Spirit. They're very tanky support heroes. They've got excellent strength growth. Compare that to the Sky Wraith Mage, who's got one armor and 700 HP. A plasma field takes out half his life. And so the Sky Wraith Mage is always going to be a threat of uh, being killed by just a Razor alone. And it looks like Kirk, he's going to be going towards a 4 star, so that will give him the Skyhawk combination. And he has recovered, he did find 2 kills in that last fight, could have actually found 3 if he chose to commit with a blink. So they do trade tier 1 for tier 1, and Nick, he's got to be careful. Kirk, he can look to go for this. Fortunately, he TP'd himself a bit too far back, and Nick should have enough movement speed to be able to back himself off. He could also use the Yule Cyclone as well, to prevent Kirk from being a lasso. And Sav, he really needs the uh, BKB before he can try to stand tall in these engagements, especially since, although even if he does get the BKB, the face's void should be able to isolate him in with the Chronosphere and kill him with the duration. But if he's able to activate the BKB before the Chronosphere flies, while he's still locked down, because it will negate all the magic damage coming out from Time Lock, it will drastically increase his likelihood of staying alive in these fights. But that being said, you still have the Death Prophet with the Exorcism running at you. And so it's the biggest power of the Death Prophet. Death Prophet's also another hero that you have a, about a 35 minute window to try to end the game in. Because she starts to taper off as well if they're eventually able to uh, get enough damage they could kill you very early on to start a fight. If they've got BKBs to mitigate your Crypt Swarm damage, Death Prophet isn't as scary. But she does scale a lot better than the Brewmaster just because she's always a threat. You always have to deal with the Crypt Swarm as well as the uh, Exorcism Bloodlock. 
Ancient Seal is being pulled back. Mystic Flare completely whiffs from Joker. So a bit of a panic flare coming up from him. Nick, he is able to clean up Saz. And Kirk, he's still holding his tails. He's got the Blink Dagger available, but Nick, Yule Cycle one's coming up, so he should be able to use that to disrupt Kirk. And might be able to keep himself alive. But it looks like Joker's able to seal the deal with a few cheeky right clicks. And Kirk, he finds a 4 staff off the back of that. So he ends a fat sack of 3 gold. And Gimli, he now needs a BKB. Because otherwise, if he doesn't catch out the uh, Brewmaster or the Dream Protector, they could interfere with his Corn Sphere, since either they could use the Overgrowth and completely disarm him, or they could use the Dragon Haze and give him such a high mischance that he's not able to effectively kill targets. But once that BKB comes online, Arrow catches, they have nothing to deal with him. Darakopter, the majority of his damage in the early stages of the game is going to be coming from uh, the Rocket Barrage as well as the cooldown. If he could completely disregard that, his right clicks aren't actually going to be too effective. But it looks like Gimli going for a Chrysalis, so really disagreeing with this double greed build. You usually want to go for a, a Molnir, it's much more cost efficient than a Daedalus over in the face's void. Because you get your damage from uh, your time lock, so you just have to stack attack speed. You don't really need to go for damage yet. But of course the advantage of it is you can get those huge crits and kill people a lot early on. But in terms of overall DPS, the Molnir will always out-DPS the Daedalus, especially if the armor value is going to be above 10. And on the priority targets like the Gyrocopter, armor is always going to be above 10. And so the Molnir does a lot more work, and it also has the benefit of the Static Storm buff that you can throw over to your Death Prophet. So Nick can just run into the fray and not really give a damn, since if they do focus them, they're going to be eating so much damage from the Exorcism Ghost and from the Static Storm buff, that it's not going to be worth that time to go into Death Prophet. And if you can't deal with the Death Prophet, because she deals so much damage just by being alive, it makes it very difficult for arrow catchers to try and win these engagements. Looks like Mystic Flare was whipped as well as the cooldown. Nick should actually be taking fall, but the swap is there, and the Ice Path flies out, catches out the Brewlings, but the Earth Pound is magic immune, so it throws out the Bottle Toss over Nick, and the Arcane Bolt actually might be enough. Two Arcane Bolts flying through. So they clean up elusively as well as Nick, and looks like Bloodlock, he's now caught in a bad situation. Joker is completely out of mana, unfortunately. He's got enough for one Arcane Bolt. Ice Path flies, but Nefty caught on the other side. He's got Clap available, still hasn't used it, just right clicks him down. And Gimli, because he knows that there's only so much he could do at this point, especially without a TP, he just decides to go for a bit of split push, but he actually doesn't have a TP scroll, so he's got to be very careful. He time walks, but Kirk doesn't have the uh, lasso yet, but still can't control him. Gimli doesn't have any way to TP on out of that. So he actually pops the Chronosphere, stands his ground against Kirk. Overgrowth not being used, he could have actually used the Overgrowth early to go for a kill attempt, uses the Leak Seed instead, and Gimli, he's going to die to the tower from the look of it. But they could have actually committed the Overgrowth to try to control and have him prevent Kark from dying, because Kark actually could have taken the fall there if RNG favored him a bit more, but Big Tropical Man just relies on the living armor instead to Gimli. Bit of a huge throw coming out from him, some Havos level plays really throws away his life for no good reason, but the three cores from Risk Esports significantly ahead of the arrow catcher equivalent. And especially since Brewmaster, he's got about 12 more minutes before he starts to taper off. Looks like he's going to, towards what looks like a BKB as the next item to guarantee that he can get a split off in these fights. Razor has a BKB. And so, uh, Qubit doesn't actually give a damn at the Brewmaster, and with the Eye of the Storm, can actually DPS down the Brewlings. And so Razor with a BKB becomes absolutely terrifying, just because he deals so much, similar to the Gyrocopter, he deals so much damage and has such a huge presence, just with his abilities, that he doesn't necessarily need to build damage. In fact, on the Razor, you should never build damage. You just have to build survivability uh, on him for him to really be effective, similar to the Viper. You get all the damage you need from the Static Link and from the Eye of the Storm. All you really need to build is uh, items that will give you survivability. So you don't have to fear it, the damage potential coming up from the enemy team. Bloodlock, going very far forward to place the wards, immediately being pinged out. And so unfortunately that's going to be immediately dewarded. The Radiant side, incredibly defensive ward, to spot out any uh, rotation paths into their jungle. Of course with their tail one down, not going to be as effective because they could always come in from the side. But concerning it pinged out, the aggressive ward placement of the Bloodlock, that's paid for itself. Brewmaster looks like he's actually going for an Aghanim Scepter, and so the Aghanim Scepter is a very powerful pickup on the Brewmaster, especially if you get it by 20 minutes, because it effectively doubles your burst combo. You've got, now got two claps to work with, and so you blink, clap, split, and clap again. That does enough damage that you could actually kill off their backline heroes very quickly, and the team that's able to pick off the enemy's uh, support heroes, their 4 and their 5, their backline, uh, has a much higher chance of winning these engagements, because in this case, for Risk Esports, all their lockdown is centered on the Jakira and on the Venture Spirit. The only other form of lockdown they have is the uh, Time Lock and the Chronosphere. And so if they're able to uh, pick off elusively and bloodlock at the start of these fights, Risk Esports, they lose a significant amount of their team fighting presence, because they no longer have the swap to be able to uh, bail out one of their cores, they no longer have the Ice Path to work on. And it looks like uh, Captain Kirk, actually let's clean up Nick. And so Captain Kirk was talking about how he wa hasn't been too effective so far ever since he's picked up the Blink, but since then he's found 5 kills for himself, so he really is starting to become a lot more effective now. Will be interesting to see what item he chooses to go for next, because he's got that Skyhook combo, 
or the blink as well as the four staff. So you blink last suit and four staff yourself out. So you might be seeing something like a BKB, so he can walk in unmolested in these engagements to guarantee getting the a good lasso off. Or he might opt to build more movement speed. So you could be seeing something like a Yule Scepter up on him. Or even a, a Bone 7 Mask of Madness to really provide that movement speed. But of course, the disadvantage of the Bat Rider is because there's Avenge, if he doesn't catch out elusively with the, sw with the uh, lasso, she's going to be able to swap him out. So long as elusively is quick to react, you should be able to ensure that they never get a good lasso off. But that being said, if you're quick with the Skyhook, and if Elusively isn't able to respond, then the Venge pickup really starts to taper off then. If you could get a good pick off with the Lasso over on, say, uh, Gimli and kill him before he could get that Chronosphere off, Risk lose the vast majority of the damage. So they've got the Aegis, so Risk Esports are now grouping up to try to play a lot more aggressively. Maybe take a Tattoo Tower off the back of the Aegis. But Arrow Catchers, they definitely do have the ability to be able to recover and turn these fights. Especially if Brewmaster and then Captain Kirk up to find a good pick-off. So Nick playing very far forward, Gimli catches that too, so both Saz as well as Captain Kirk. Joker actually runs into the Chronosphere, and Saz dies before the fight even begins. Macropire dropped on top of that Joker, Potato Flare coming up from him, but he gets cleaned up by Nick, and with the Liquid Fire and the Exorcism, they should be the final kill. Captain Kirk goes in, but unfortunately wasn't able to last two in time, so now he's going to get cleaned up. Silence as well as the Ice Path, so the throw's coming up from Arrow Catchers, and that could actually be a tier 3 tower they lose as well. Exorcism is still up, and they still have the Aegis. They could choose to commit to this if they really want to. They've got at least 30 seconds to try to push before the gyrocopter comes online. Because the Mystic Flares down looks like Exorcism is wearing off, so they get a bit of chip damage over on that tier 3 and then back off once their heroes respawn. Swap is used aggressively against Big Tropical Man, throws out the Living Armor, but Nefty blinks and gets caught out the Ice Path as well. And Batrider immediately buys back. He's got Lasso available, but Captain Kirk, the rest of his team isn't there. So it's a wasted buyback and they're going to lose a set of racks for this. It's a great place coming up elusively. Kirk comes in, catches it elusively to prevent the swap, even though it's on cooldown. Yule Scepter being used to actually interrupt that, and they do kill him, but Split's now being used in a, a suboptimal position because he wasn't able to start with a clap. They're able to clean up a Rax and Bloodlock. He doesn't really care if he dies since he was able to accomplish his job. Should be taking the fall, and the Flame Break from Captain Kirk cleans him up. A Cubit immediately TPing on out. Gimli, if they're able to kill Gimli, that'll be worthwhile for them. It looks like he's actually going for a Daedalus, so he's going to be stacking damage. No BKB. Needed, so a lot of balls coming up from him, because he has been catching out uh, their priority targets, I suppose he doesn't necessarily need a BKB yet. But considering the fact that the uh, train protector can completely disable him in these engagements with the overgrowth, very risky uh, play style coming out from the Faceless Void. Fortunately, it looks like they weren't able to kill him, despite the fact that he had no TP scroll. And so Gim Gimli, once again, able to do his thing. And with that set of racks down, Risk Esports put themselves in a very commanding position for this game. Arrow catches, because Brewmaster's got about 7 more minutes before he starts to taper off, and because they've already lost the high ground advantage of having their tier 3 tower up, it's very difficult for them to try to take these fights or to try to capitalize. Because if you look at Risk Esports, they've only lost one tower. Their tier 1 is still up on both their top lane and their bot lane, so even if they get completely wiped, at most all arrow catches will be able to do is take a tower, maybe take two towers before Risk is back up. And that's assuming they don't buy back. And so Risk, they can afford to play a lot more uh, far forward because they know that they've got the guarantee of being able to hold on to their high ground if they get even if they get wiped. And so they still have Aegis the model up and now Daedalus up on Gimli. And so he's gonna deal an absolutely obscene amount of damage. Looks like they're gonna be rotating into the mid lane. And they decide to uh, they're pinging up bot. So Cubit, Aghanim Scepter not up. I think he might actually have that flying out to him. Over in the Korea, yeah he does. And so the advantage of the Aghanim Scepter over on Razor is it gives you two ways to slow siege. You've got the Death Prophet and you've got the Razor that can just sit there at high ground, force the rotation coming out uh, from arrow catches, force them to initiate on you, and then Gimli comes in when you clump up and catches you up the Chronosphere. Because Gimli, he doesn't care if he catches out the Death Prophet and the Razor, so long as they pop their ultimates. Exorcism and I, the Storm will persist through the Chronosphere, and so even though it does put them at a disadvantage, even though ideally he doesn't want to catch them out, he could afford to let them play far forward, poke their tower, poke the bear, wait for them to respond, and then if they choose to react, then you jump on them. Otherwise, if they don't, they're going to lose their towers of slow siege. Because you've got the Eye of the Storm constantly nimbling away the tower. Gimli runs far forward, catches out Saz with the uh, Chronosphere. He should be a kill him in time. The Mystic Flare did a huge amount of work. Actually, Gimli died from that Mystic Flare. And so he chose to sat there and eat it. He could have repositioned himself at any time with a thousand movement speed. So it's a lack of BKB sound and punish him. Saz pops his BKB, dies immediately, does get the cooldown off, but the cooldown is not going to be enough. And Cubit and Nick with the ultimates up, they should be able to take a set of racks. Nevda, Nevdi comes in, throws out the clap into split. Gimli 
gets four staffs out, so there's two four staffs available, and the Broodlings are immediately being killed off. So this is what I'm talking about. He's reached the point where he's plateauing, and he can now kill Brewmaster inside the split. So once you reach that point, Brewmaster no longer becomes effective. So Cubert finds an ultra kill, and Neki decides to steal the rampage from him. So we'll be wouldn't be too surprised if I see GG being called out by air catches at this point. Risk of lineup the three calls of hit critical mass and they know it. So GG being called actually risk calling GG. So a lot of bad mana is coming out from them. But it looks like that'll be it. So game one does go to risk and this is a best of one. So risk now move on to the next bracket or the next round at least for the Samsung uh, Cyber Gamer Open League. So I believe that will be it for now at 9:30 AEST or 11:30 New Zealand Standard Time. Uh, Risk will be playing in the Join Dota Open League, so stay tuned for them, but otherwise, that will be all for now. 49, signing out.